Well, we're going to get started. Uh, thank you for coming uh, to our lecture today. My name is Brendan Rensink. I'm the Assistant Director of the Charles Red Center for Western Studies, and we are hosting this lecture. The Red Center is an interdisciplinary Western Studies Research Center. We fund student and faculty and independent scholar research having to do with pretty much anything in the American West. And we, should, we need to make a comprehensive list of all the disciplines and types of projects we funded, but just, just about every discipline you can think of. Um, and a big part of what we do also is bringing uh, lecturers to come here to campus, uh, to speak here to the campus community, and then also to make those videos available online as well. Uh, our speaker uh, today, David Barron, uh, will be talking to us about the 1878 solar eclipse. Uh, before that, we're going to have an invocation offered by the Red Center Office Specialist Amy Carlin, and then the Red Center Director Brian Cannon will introduce today's speaker. Our Father in Heaven, we are so grateful for the opportunity that we have to be gathered here together at this beautiful university. We are grateful for the opportunity that we have to learn. We are very grateful that Professor Barron has been able to join us for today's lecture. We ask thy blessing on him, that he may be able to present and explain all that he desires to, and that we may be receptive to the knowledge that we may gain here today. We love thee and say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. So it's my uh, privilege to introduce uh, our lecturer, David Barron. David uh, comes from New England, he grew up in the Boston area and attended Yale University where he majored in physics. He's a journalist, author, and broadcaster who has spent his 30-year career largely in public radio. He's worked as an environmental correspondent for NPR, a science reporter for Boston Public Radio, and a health and science editor for PRI's The World. Currently, he's affiliated with the University of Colorado's Center for Environmental Journalism. In the course of his reporting, David has visited every continent, including Antarctica, and earned some of the top honors in journalism. These include the Lowell Thomas Award from the Overseas Press Club of America, the Alfred I. DuPont Award from Columbia University, the National Academies Communications Award, and on three occasions, the annual Journalism Prize from the American Association for the Advancement of Science. David's written work has appeared in the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Daily Beast, Boston Globe, Outside, Lonely Planet, Mental Floss, and Reader's Digest. His 2003 book, The Beast in the Garden, received the Colorado Book Award. His book, American Eclipse, was published earlier this year, and the Charles Red Center is pleased to have been able to support the research that he did on that book with an independent, independent research and creative works award. Uh, please join me in welcoming Mr. Barron. Thank you, Brian. Thank you all for being here. How many of you are here from an astronomy class? Oh, wow. And how many from a history class? Well, perfect. All right. Well, this is going to be a combination of astronomy and history. And uh, so first, I just want to thank the Red Center for bringing me here and, and for helping to fund the research for my book. Um, I am not like most of the folks who've been at this podium before as part of the speaker series. I am not a professional historian. <laughs> I don't have a PhD in history. I studied physics in college. I'm something of an accidental historian. Uh, and so before I get to the formal part of my talk, and I will have plenty of slides to show, I just want to talk a little bit about how I fell into history uh, in doing this project. And so it all started, and this is actually with, uh, uh, with the book that just came out. But for, let me also ask you all, how many of you on August 21st saw the eclipse, either partial or total? Okay, so how many of you were here in Utah on that day? So you saw a very deep partial eclipse, uh, over 90% probably where you were. And how many of you saw the total eclipse, which meant you went up to, uh, and how many of you who saw it, was it an amazing experience? Yeah, it's, for those of you who missed the total eclipse, 
I hope that I will convince you of nothing else today. I will convince you that you must go see the next total eclipse in the United States, which will be in 2024. So I actually had been looking forward to August 21st of this year for 19 years. Since 1998, I had been planning for August 21st, 2017. And in fact, that's how long I've been planning my book, which I will be talking to you about. Uh, and the story of how it all came about actually goes back even further than that to 1994. So back in the 1990s, I was a science correspondent for NPR. And in May of 1994, a solar eclipse, a partial solar eclipse, was set to cross the country. And so I did a story about this for Morning Edition. And I interviewed an astronomer uh, to find out uh, how people could observe it, what was going to happen. And in the course of this interview with the astronomer, um, he explained that, you know, as interesting as a partial solar eclipse is, a much rarer total solar eclipse uh, is completely different. In a total eclipse, of course, for all of two or three minutes, the moon completely blocks the face of the sun, creating what he described as the most awe-inspiring spectacle in all of nature. And so then this astronomer, whom I'd never met before, said something that I will never forget. He said, you know, before you die, you owe it to yourself to experience a total solar eclipse. It is that impressive. And he said it with such conviction and sincerity that he got my attention and I took it seriously. So I started to do some research. Well, the first thing I learned, of course, is that if you wait for a total solar eclipse to come to you, you're going to be waiting a long time because any given point on Earth experiences a total eclipse about once every 400 years. But if you're willing to travel, you don't have to wait that long. And so I learned that a few years later, in 1998, a total eclipse was going to cross the Caribbean. Now, a total eclipse is visible only along a very narrow path, usually about 100 miles wide, where the moon's shadow falls, and that's called the Path of Totality. And in February 1998, the Path of Totality was going to cross Aruba. So I thought, well, February, Aruba, sounded like a good idea anyway. So I went south to enjoy the sun and to see what would happen when the sun went away. So the day of the eclipse, uh, I was out behind the Hyatt Regency on the beach with a whole crowd of people waiting for the show to begin. And we were wearing eclipse glasses like you may have gotten this year with cardboard frames and really dark lenses that enabled us to look at the sun safely. And a total eclipse begins as a partial eclipse as the moon very slowly makes its way in front of the sun. So first, we could see that it looked like the sun had a little notch in its edge and then the notch grew larger and larger, eventually turning the sun into a crescent. And it was all very interesting, but I wouldn't say it was spectacular. I mean, the day remained bright. If I hadn't known what was going on overhead, I wouldn't have realized that anything unusual was going on. Well, about 10 minutes before the total eclipse was set to begin, weird things started to happen. So here I am on this tropical beach, and a cool wind kicks up. And, and then I noticed that daylight looks weird. Colors were off and shadows looked very strange. They'd become bizarrely sharp, like someone had turned up the contrast knob on TV. And then I looked offshore and I noticed running lights on boats. So clearly it was getting dark, although I hadn't realized it. Well, soon it was obvious it was getting dark. It felt like my eyesight was failing. And then all of a sudden, the lights went out. Well, at that, a cheer erupted from the beach. And I took off my eclipse glasses because now, during the total phase of the eclipse, it was safe to look at the sun with the naked eye. And I looked up in the sky, and I was just dumbfounded. You know, at this point, I was in my mid-30s. I had lived on Earth long enough to know what the sky looks like, right? I mean, I'd seen blue skies and gray skies and starry skies and angry skies and pink skies at sunrise. 
But this was a sky I had never seen. So first there were the colors. Up above, it was this deep purple gray, like twilight. While on the horizon, it was orange, like sunset, 360 degrees. And up above, in the twilight, bright stars and planets had come out. So there was Jupiter, and there was Mercury, and there was Venus, and the planets were all in a line. And there, sitting among the planets, was this thing, this glorious, bewildering thing. It, it looked like a wreath woven out of silvery thread, and it just hung out there in space, shimmering. Now that was the sun's outer atmosphere, the solar corona. And for those of you who did not get to see the total eclipse this year, I tell you, pictures just don't do it justice. It is not just some halo or ring around the black moon. It's finely textured. It looks like it's made out of strands of silk. And although it looked nothing like our sun, of course, I knew that's what it was. So there was the sun. And there were the planets. <laughs> and I could see how the planets revolve around the sun. It was as if I had left our solar system and was standing on some alien world looking back at creation. And for the first time in my life, I just felt viscerally connected to the universe in all of its immensity. Well, <laughs> I stood there in what I could only describe as a state of nirvana for all of 174 seconds, less than three minutes, at which point it was over. The sun came back out, the blue sky returned, the stars and the planets and the corona were gone, the world returned to normal, but I had changed. And so that's how I became an eclipse chaser. And so this is now how I spend my time and hard-earned money. Every couple of years I head off to wherever the moon's shadow will fall to experience another few minutes of cosmic bliss. But on that beach, in Aruba, in 1998, as a science writer, I thought, I'm going to write a book about eclipse chasing. But I knew that the time to come out with the book was not then. It was going to be 2017, because this was the time when Americans would actually care about eclipses. So I put the project on hold and figured I'd wait 19 years to come out with the book. And as the years went by, I started to think, well, what will the book be about? Well, I, I didn't want to just write some textbook about eclipses or some how-to guide to viewing the total eclipse. I like to tell stories. I wanted to find a really good eclipse story to tell, something worthy of a book. So I started to, to, to scope around. And eventually, I came across what I thought was the right topic. And it just so happens. It comes from the very part of the world that we are in right now, which is the American West. So, the West is, of course, a landscape that's filled with history and legends. The gunfight at the OK Corral, the Battle of the Little Bighorn, Calamity Jane, Buffalo Bill. It's sometimes hard to know where facts end and fiction begins. Well, six years ago, I came across a particularly puzzling tale from the Old West. Now, I live in Colorado, in Boulder. And if you drive north from there, up I-25 to Wyoming, then west across the Laramie Plains and over the snowy range of the Medicine Bow Mountains, eventually you'll come to the Sierra Madres. And this is where you'll find Battle Lake. And here, along the, the side of State Highway 70, you'll find a historical marker. And this is what it says. Thomas A. Edison camped near this spot in 1878 while on a fishing trip. It was here that his attention was directed to the fiber from his bamboo fishing pole, which he tested as a suitable filament for his incandescent electric lamp. Well, the claim put more plainly elsewhere is that it was here in Wyoming that Thomas Edison, in a flash of inspiration, devised his light bulb. Well, I thought that was pretty intriguing, and I wanted to know, is that true? Well, what better place to look than True West magazine? And indeed, back in the 1960s, they ran an article about this. It is a fact that Edison came west in 1878 
just before he invented the light bulb. He did go fishing at Battle Lake. And what brought him to Wyoming? Well, he was in the West with a bunch of astronomers, and they had come to observe a total solar eclipse. And that is Thomas Edison right there, second from the right. So I decided to look into this, to delve into the archives, to go back in time, to learn why Edison came for the eclipse, who were his companions, why was the eclipse so important, and what lasting impact did it have? Now let me say right off the bat that the light bulb story is legend. Edison did not invent the light bulb in Wyoming. But the true story is no less compelling. As I discovered, and as I write in my book, Edison and others who came west in 1878 did change America in some profound ways, and the eclipse was the catalyst. So let me tell you the true story of this scientist who raced to the American frontier for the total solar eclipse of 1878. Now first, a little bit of context. In 1878, the general outlines of modern America were already in place. Our national borders looked like they do today. The Civil War was over. The nation had 38 states. The most recent addition was Colorado. We were a vibrant, can-do nation, population 50 million and growing fast. We were building big cities, and we were spreading west. The mindset, the rallying cry, was manifest destiny. The Transcontinental Railroad had recently been completed, opening up a new territory to settlement and sparking clashes between the pioneers and Native Americans. We were a rapidly developing, adolescent nation. We had just celebrated our 100th birthday, and you might say we were intellectually immature. Europe was the center of Western culture. That's the place where respectable uh, literature and music and art came from, and Europe led the world in science. In fact, Europe led the world in chasing eclipses. Now, let me get a few basics out of the way about eclipses. A solar eclipse occurs when the moon passes between the sun and the earth, and the moon therefore casts its shadow on the earth. Now the moon's shadow actually has two distinct parts, so I'll zoom in just to look at the moon and the earth. So this outer area, uh, this with the dashed line, that's called the penumbra, that's a zone of partial shadow. And anyone here in this large circle will see a partial solar eclipse. The inner zone, the dark part of the shadow, is called the umbra. And it's only where that intersects with the, the planet that, that you get to see a total solar eclipse in that dark circle there. Now, of course, everything is in motion. The moon is orbiting around the Earth. The Earth is turning. So things don't sit still. And what you end up with is this dark shadow zooming across the face of the Earth. Uh, and it traces out a line, if you can see here along the bottom, uh, that is the path of totality of this particular eclipse here. Um, anyone in that zone will have the umbra pass over uh, for all of two or three minutes. Now, a total eclipse occurs somewhere on Earth about once every 18 months. So over time, if you were to map these out and map out these paths of totality, they will look sort of like you've taken spaghetti and thrown it at a map. So this shows the paths of totality for total eclipses from 1842 to 1893, from the mid to late 19th century. And this is a particularly interesting period because it was during this time uh, that total eclipses weren't just interesting spectacles to gawk at, they were actually very important to science. In fact, it's been called the golden age of eclipse expeditions. Uh, because this was a time when scientists were just starting to unravel the mysteries of the sun. What is this great ball of fire in the sky? What fuels it? What, what is it made out of? And there were certain studies that they could do of the sun only during a total solar eclipse. So whenever, that, whenever a total eclipse occurred, of course, uh, the, the dark moon covers the, the bright face of the sun, which enables scientists to look at what surrounds the sun, these flame-like things called prominences, and the ethereal corona. 
So during this period, whenever a total solar eclipse was predicted, such as this one across India in 1871, astronomers took their telescopes and spectroscopes and other equipment and they'd head off to sit in the path of totality. They would hope that clouds didn't show up uh, and they'd frantically conduct their studies in those two or three minutes of midday darkness. And this is actually a British team in India in 1871. Now the United States did launch eclipse expeditions as well, but the Europeans were the clear leaders. Until, that is, 1878, when the moon's shadow was set to visit our own backyard. The date was July 29th, 1878, and the path of totality ran right down the American frontier, Montana Territory down to Texas. So here was a chance for uh, American, America's science to, to shine, to show the world what we could do, or an opportunity to slip up and embarrass ourselves. But if all went well, we would be able to show Europe that we could do science, that we, you know, we could take advantage of this opportunity ourselves. So the eclipse of 1878 became a big national undertaking. The U.S. government issued instructions for observing the eclipse, how to view it safely, and how to collect information that could help astronomers. Now, the solar corona, what we know today is the sun's outer atmosphere, back then it was a tremendous mystery. Just, scientists didn't know what it was, and just characterizing its shape and size was important for astronomers. So in an early form of crowdsourcing, the US government asked the general public, people who are artistically inclined, to sketch the corona and send their artwork to Washington. So the instructions included a template you could use and an example of what a proper drawing might look like showing the contours of the outer and inner corona. Uh, meanwhile, the US government uh, offered logistical advice on railroad travel for those going privately. And the US Naval Observatory put out the call for scientist volunteers to participate in a half dozen government eclipse expeditions that were being assembled as well. And the responses came back sort of like uh, RSVPs to a wedding invitation. So you can see here the Cincinnati Observatory has accepted the invitation to come out west for the eclipse. The Morrison Observatory accepts. Yale College accepts. Harvard sends its regrets. <clears throat> So the government assembled its scientific parties and dispatched them to the frontier to meet the moon's shadow. Uh, now this is one group of US Naval Observatory scientists, you can see them sitting here, on the roof of a hotel. This is the Teller House Hotel in the uh, gold mining town of Central City, Colorado. Uh, which was that, so that was their observing platform. Uh, Denver was also in the path of totality and that's where this group from Princeton camped out for a month preparing for the eclipse. The camp was tucked in a grove of cottonwoods uh, where they had hung an American flag and two uh, black and orange college flags on either side of the entrance. And it was a pretty elaborate setup. They had a whole bunch of equipment that they set up on these, uh, on these sturdy posts. And it was fairly comfortable. They had a, a cook taking care of the, uh, the, uh, the meals for them. Now to the south of Denver in Colorado Springs, uh, much more difficult conditions were encountered by scientists who established an observation post on the summit of Pikes Peak. Now there's no photograph of their camp, unfortunately, but uh, they made their base of operations a government weather station that used to exist at the very top of Pikes Peak. It was manned year-round and was connected to the outside world by a 17-mile telegraph line that went down to Colorado Springs. And there were three main scientists who went to Pikes Peak for the eclipse uh, and depicted here on a pleasant day before the eclipse uh, looking at their shadows cast on the clouds that were passing below them. Um, but for most of the time for these guys on Pikes Peak things were not pleasant. They had quite a, a hell of a time up there. Uh, they endured snowstorms in July and suffered from severe altitude sickness. Meanwhile, to the north of Colorado in Wyoming, this camp was established by the U.S. Naval Observatory right beside the Transcontinental Railroad. You can see 
this temporary structure they set up with their telescopes inside and a canvas roof that they could easily remove. And also in Wyoming, of course, was this group of people. So let me talk for a moment about this extraordinary collection of scientific talent that ended up in the rough and tumble railroad town of Rawlins, Wyoming in 1878. And I'll mention just a few of these esteemed individuals. And let me zoom in on this area here on the right. So here again is Thomas Edison, and I'll get to him in a moment. Uh, but to the right of him, from our perspective, was Norman Lockyer. Now, Norman Lockyer was a British astronomer, and he's the man who famously first identified the element helium, which he found in the sun long before it was ever discovered on Earth. Uh, and Lockyer was an incredibly influential man because he was also the founding editor of the scientific journal Nature, which is still published today and remains one of the top scientific journals in the world. Uh, here on the left, beside his wife Annette, this large gentleman, uh, that's James Craig Watson. Now, Watson was a professor of astronomy at the University of Michigan. Uh, this was his domain, the paradoxically named Detroit Observatory, which was actually in Ann Arbor. Uh, and Watson was known as a planet hunter. You see, if you were to look at a solar system chart from that era, such as this one from 1846, you'll notice that the planets look a little different from the way they do today. Now first, if I zoom in on the region between uh, Mars and Jupiter, you'll notice some additional planets. So we've got Mars, Vesta, Juno, Ceres, Pallas, and then Jupiter. Well, this is the asteroid belt, and these are asteroids. Uh, but back in that era, asteroids were considered planets. They were called minor planets, but they got names just like the major ones, and finding them was a big deal. Well, James Craig Watson had a knack for discovering asteroids. He was one of the top planet hunters in the world. Now, if I zoom in even closer to the sun, you'll see something even more perplexing. And that is, between Mercury and the sun, there's another planet. Vulcan. Now Vulcan, long before it showed up on Star Trek, was thought to be a real planet. It was a hypothetical planet. Astronomers thought it had to exist because Mercury's orbit didn't make sense otherwise. Mercury behaved as if something was tugging on it. And astronomers figured that something was a planet, or it could have been several planets, between it and the sun. Now, no one had ever, had ever reliably seen Vulcan, but that wasn't really a surprise. It's so close to the sun, it would never be in the sky at night, and you couldn't see it in the daytime because it would be lost in the sun's glare. About the only time you might actually catch a glimpse of Vulcan would be during a total solar eclipse, when the moon very briefly covers the bright sun and you can look at what's around the sun. So James Craig Watson, the world-renowned planet hunter was determined to find Vulcan, and he came out to Wyoming to look for it. So there's Watson again. Now as for Thomas Edison, he was just 31 years old in 1878, but he was already a global celebrity due to a recent invention, and that was the phonograph. Now this simple contraption with a hand crank and tin foil that would record sound was an absolute sensation. I mean, it's hard to even imagine, but back in that era, no one thought it would ever be possible to record and re-release sound at will. Edison was hailed as a genius. He was called a wizard. Indeed, he was the wizard of Menlo Park because he had his famous laboratory in Menlo Park, New Jersey at that time. Well, this was a ridiculously <clears throat> productive and creative time for Edison. He was constantly dreaming up strange and wondrous inventions. Uh, there was the aerophone, an enormous loudspeaker that he suggested could be installed in lighthouses to shout warnings at ships. <laughs> uh, there was the phonomotor, which took a, the power of the human voice to turn a wheel. And there was this thing, the tesimeter. 
Now, the tesimeter was an extremely sensitive heat detector, basically an electric thermometer that Edison suggested could measure uh, changes in temperature as small as one millionth of a degree Fahrenheit. Uh, today, we would call the tesimeter an infrared detector. Now, it was an astronomer who had actually encouraged Edison to invent the device, and a number of us astronomers wanted to use it during the eclipse and to train it on the solar corona to see if that mysterious aura gave off heat as well as light. Well, in the end, Edison decided that he would come west and do the experiment himself. This was a chance for Edison to show that he wasn't just an inventor, but he was actually a serious scientist. Well, these were not the most serious of surroundings, however. This was the Wild West, after all. And Edison ended up attaching his tesimeter to a telescope and putting it in this structure back here. That's the telescope back there that Edison used. You can see it looks sort of like, a, like an outhouse. It's actually a hen house that Edison retrofitted into his makeshift observatory. Now, there were dozens of notable scientists who came west to observe the eclipse in 1878, and in my book I write about many of them. Uh, but in the end, I focus on three main characters. Now, one, of course, is Edison, uh, also Watson, the planet hunter. And the third scientist that I focus on actually traveled to the frontier with very different intent. And that was Mariah Mitchell. Now, Mariah Mitchell was by far the most famous female scientist in America in the 1800s. She first came to prominence in 1847 when she discovered a comet and received a gold medal from the King of Denmark. Well, by 1878, she was teaching at Vassar. She was teaching astronomy uh, at Vassar, which was the pioneering all-women's college in Poughkeepsie, New York. Well, no surprise, Mitchell was a staunch advocate for women's higher education. And this was a time when women's colleges were coming under attack. You see, in 1873, a sensational best-selling book came out that claimed that college education could ruin a girl's health. It was written by a Boston doctor, Edward H. Clark, who argued that by taxing the brain, education sapped energy from other parts of a girl's maturing body including her reproductive organs. And therefore, higher learning could turn female college students into sterile, masculine invalids. And I am not kidding about this. Education, he wrote, could re result in a dropping out of maternal instincts and an appearance of Amazonian coarseness and force. Such persons are analogous to the sexless class of termites. Well, Mariah Mitchell believed that this was ridiculous. She encouraged young women to use their brains in her astronomy courses at Vassar. But that wasn't enough. She needed to convince American society that Dr. Clark's book was rubbish. So in 1878, she did something remarkable. As groups of men were assembling eclipse expeditions to Colorado and Wyoming, she assembled an all-female expedition. And so this is the Vassar College Eclipse Party in Denver in 1878, and this is Mariah Mitchell right here. And it wasn't just a scientific endeavor, it was in essence a kind of political theater, an effort to show the American public that women could be smart, educated, healthy, and feminine to boot. So these three main characters of mine had a lot on the line. Edison was out to prove the value of his tesimeter and to show that he was a serious scientist. Uh, Watson was out to find Vulcan and the glory that would come from discovering the planet. And Mitchell was out to change minds about the role of women in science and higher education. And so in this and other ways, the eclipse was a kind of competition and the public followed closely the various players and what they were out to prove. So this country that was not generally known for caring about science suddenly became interested in astronomy. And newspapers met the demand for information by providing extensive coverage. This is the Chicago Tribune from a week before the eclipse. And you can see that they have a, a map showing the path of totality. 
They have a, a star chart showing what stars and planets you might see in the heavens if you are in the path of totality. They had articles about what the scientists were up to. And although Chicago was outside of the path of the total eclipse, people were keen to get a front row seat. So there were advertisements for eclipse tours, just like today. People headed to the path of totality. And the destination for most eclipse tourists that year was Denver. The city was overrun with visitors. The hotels ran out of rooms, so guests were left to sleep on cots in hotel dining rooms and parlors, and one gentleman reportedly ended up sleeping on a billiard table. And as for the local residents, they grew tremendously excited about the eclipse. Everyone was excited about what was going to happen, and, and this really surprised me. I mean, I imagine the early settlers in Colorado as just defiantly practical people who just cared about mining and ranching and farming, but they, they got really excited about astronomy as well. Uh, they, they were eager to learn from the scientists and they wanted to assist the scientists as well. This is one letter I found at the National Archives, a letter from a, a, an Episcopal minister in, in Boulder who wrote to a government astronomer in Washington a few weeks before the eclipse, and this is what he wrote. I have received the copy of the eclipse supplement you so kindly sent and will endeavor to show my patriotism and interest in the advance of science by taking observations from some point. A few of our citizens have interested themselves to attend to the matter here and doubtless others will in other parts. And indeed in Denver, a, uh, a Chicago astronomer by the name of Elias Colbert ended up organizing a class in how to draw the corona, and he asked for volunteers, and he ended up with 20 volunteers, just members of the public, who met with him a couple of times before the eclipse, and what he would do is he would draw the, uh, the corona on the blackboard, he would do it in much more, uh, uh, much more detail than that, but he would have the students practice in how to make really quick and accurate drawings, because again, the eclipse was only going to last three minutes, and because that wasn't enough time for any one person to really sketch the corona in detail, he had a very clever idea, which is he divided the group up into, into quarters, and everyone was responsible for just, for just drawing a quarter of the eclipse, like the, the upper right or the lower left, and to do it in as much detail as they could. And then afterwards, he would combine these partial drawings into a composite view that he hoped would be kind of the established view of the total eclipse of 1878 from Denver. Uh, anyway, as, as he was doing this, the rest of Denver was getting ready for the eclipse, cho choosing where to view it, making plans to shut down their businesses for the day. People were procuring eclipse glasses. Now, there were no mass-produced uh, glasses with mylar lenses like we have today, but newsboys took shards of, of clear glass and smoked them over flames, or they took pieces of colored glass this is a, sharp, a piece of blue glass, as you can see, and they would use these as eclipse glasses. And in fact, the newsboys sold these on, on, eclipse, on uh, street corners. Here's your colored glass for seeing the eclipse, they cried, and this is verbatim from an 1878 article. Genuine French imported Mazarine blue, London smoke and bottle green, three kinds, three cents each or two for five. And this is an actual piece of eclipse glass from 1878, which I actually only came across last month when I was giving a talk at the History Museum in Denver. And uh, uh, a guy who had it handed down through his family since 1878 brought it along and showed me how to use it. Uh, but it's just a piece of, of dark glass about the size of a nickel that was put in a cardboard holder. Well, I had great fun. Uh, just reliving history by tracking down uh, stuff like this and retracing my character's footsteps as I did the research for my book. So I went to Vassar College where I visited the, uh, the uh, observatory that Mariah Mitchell used to preside over and that she still does, although now as a bronze bust. <laughs> I visited Edison's famous Menlo Park Laboratory, which was reconstructed in Michigan by Henry Ford, and that's where I found a tesimeter. And also in Michigan, you can go to uh, James Craig Watson's Detroit Observatory in Ann Arbor. And nearby in Ypsilanti, I was able to find the telescope that Watson took to Wyoming to look for Vulcan. So that telescope is this one front and center 
in that 1878 photo. I went up to Rollins to find the spot where the photo was taken. That was a bit of a disappointment. It's actually now the parking lot at the post office. But most of my research was done in Washington at the Library of Congress and the National Archives because it's here that a lot of the original documents have been stored. Crumbling envelopes and files filled with letters and telegrams and scientific reports. And remember, I told you that the government was interested in artwork of the eclipse. Well, the general public and scientists submitted their drawings and paintings to Washington. From simple pencil sketches, such as this one, which was actually drawn by Wyoming's territorial governor, John W. Hoyt. Other depictions were more colorful and elaborate. I love this watercolor from Denver. And this a sketch, uh, this is from uh, <coughs> Central City, Colorado. This is a pastel that was done from Southern Colorado uh, in La Junta. This is a pretty uh, elaborate depiction by a, a British amateur astronomer who came over to Denver. And this, well, this is the composite view made by the people of Denver. This was by, from Elias Colbert's Corona drawing class. So 20 members of the public uh, were able to, to, uh, to sketch this out uh, together. And this, one of my favorites, this was the view from 14,000 feet up from on top of Pikes Peak where the folks who had to endure snowstorms and altitude sickness were treated with just a spectacular view of the solar corona from so high up. Well, as you can tell, on Eclipse Day itself, many folks enjoyed an amazing view of the spectacle, and it was a proud and exciting day for my three main characters. Now, I don't want to spoil the story by giving it all away, but Edison's tesimeter was declared a success. It was going to be bigger than the phonograph. <clears throat> At least some said that. Mariah Mitchell, well, she made quite a splash. The folks on the frontier were impressed by her bold display of femininity and fortitude. And what about James Craig Watson, the planet hunter? He found Vulcan, or at least so he thought. So this is his uh, star chart, and here this, is, this is represents the eclipsed sun, and that's where he has marked Vulcan. And I'll zoom in there. You can see that's where he spotted the long-sought planet. Well, the headlines were effusive. Great results announced a Chicago paper. Most important observations ever made, said the New York Herald. It was a banner day for these scientists, and it was for America, too. The eclipse that crossed the frontier enabled this young country to prove to the world that it could do science. It could take on Europe. As one local boasted to a visitor from England, Sir, Colorado can beat the world in eclipses as in everything else. <laughs> the Rocky Mountain eclipse helped boost America's interest in science and bolstered its confidence in that realm. Now, admittedly, the specific achievements of my three main characters did not quite pan out. Mariah Mitchell did help open the doors of science to women, but it's not like male scientists suddenly embraced their female counterparts. It was the beginning of a long, hard, continuing struggle. Watson's discovery of Vulcan, well, as you may have surmised, it was faulty. There is no planet between Mercury and the Sun. And poor Watson, well, he worked himself to death two years after the eclipse at age 42, pursuing a crazy scheme to try to prove that, in fact, he'd been right. As for Edison's tesimeter, well, it never did live up to the hype. And Edison quickly turned to other projects. In fact, the very day after he returned to New Jersey from Wyoming, he started work on a new invention. Now, there are some connections between the eclipse and the light bulb. The scientists Edison spent time with in the West encouraged him to take on the, the challenge of electric light and power. And the time away from the laboratory left, it left Edison refreshed and ready to take on new projects. But did Edison dream up the light bulb on the shores of Battle Lake? No. The eclipse of 1878 did not illuminate America in the way the historical marker claims. However, it did 
enlighten America, helping to push this upstart nation toward what it soon would become, the undeniable global superpower in science, a country that would, in this intellectual realm, eclipse the world. Thank you.